Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Priya Natarajan. I am an astrophysicist and the current director of Yale's Frankie program in science and the humanities. I am delighted to have you all to welcome you to today's wonderful talk titled White Gold Fever, the story of deep sea treasure and an environmental tragedy by the esteemed journalist Esther Honig. Uh, before I start uh, giving you a brief bi um, bio of Esther's, I would like to um, recognize our benefactors, Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie, uh, whose support for interdisciplinary scholarship at Yale has made this and many other ventures around Yale possible. Um, in particular, I give out a warm shout out to Barbara Frankie, who is in the audience today. And um, as part of my required duties, let me also remind you that um, uh, for those of us who are assembled, that we are recording this event and that all participants will therefore have to have their videos muted for the duration of the talk. Uh, Q, uh, questions may be submitted at any time to the Q&A feature, and we will have a um, dedicated Q&A session after um, Esther's uh, talk. So let me tell you a little bit more about this fascinating um, author. Um, Esther works both in print and audio to uh, create stories that are on the, at the focus of the intersection of agriculture, immigration, and climate change, um, a perfect fit to the interdisciplinary nature of uh, the activities at, um, at Frankie. She's a fluent Spanish speaker with a degree in Spanish and Latin American studies, and uh, she travels to Mexico and across the US to carry out her reporting. She is an incredible storyteller, as you will all see very shortly. Her work has been published by The Nation, Snap Judgment, Latino USA, National Public Radio, and much more. Her piece for Mother Jones magazine about the spread of COVID-19 inside Midwestern meatpacking plants was cited by US senators in a letter confronting corporate uh, executives. So she also um, not only tell stories, but stories that make us understand accountability, accountability to each other, accountability to the earth, accountability to um, climate change. Uh, she's the recipient of the UC Berkeley's 11th Hour Food and Farming Fellowship, and her work has been recognized by the Edward R. Morrow Awards and the Society for Professional Journalists. She has been invited to present her work at tons of conferences and universities. She cut her teeth as a reporter working for public radio stations across the country where she covered everything from oh, the opioid epidemic to impacts of Trump's immigration policies. These days, um, Esther noted that she prefers to work on in-depth narrative driven stories that stray as, as far away as possible from the grind of the immediate daily news. So before I turn over to um, Esther for this evening, I let me just mention our learning um, by doing project, please consider contributing simple science experiments that you can do at home for kids uh, to our website, little videos, uh, take a look at our website to see how to do that. And I also want to advertise our event uh, as part of the Understanding the Nature of Inference Colloquium series, we have our virtual talk by Professor Brian Cantwell-Smith, which is on Wednesday, December 7th, and a discussion session on the 8th, both at 3 p.m. Anyway, without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Esther Honig. Thank you so much, Esther, for coming. We're absolutely delighted and cannot wait to hear from you. Thank you so much. That was such a lovely introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here today and share this story with you. Um, this was took many months. It was part of a, a strong team of editors and producers at Snap Judgment. And um, without further ado, uh, we're just going to jump into it. And I'm going to share this, this story that I love so much with you all. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. White Gold Fever, story of deep sea treasure and environmental tragedy. So our story begins. Um, this is Belen Delgado, and he's the protagonist of our story. He first learned to fish at the age of 10, and he's been doing this all his life. And I'm just gonna start off by playing you the opening cut of tape from my story. Aquí donde revienta la ola esa, donde revientan, de ahí para allá, había callo de hacha. Toda esa zona, toda esa área, toda, 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 donde ves aquella lancha que se ve, Más para allá. Todo eso que ves, 
Todo, 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 todo. Es, era el banco de Cayo de Hacha. Standing on an empty beach, covered in fog, Belén Delgado points to an area on the horizon where 15 years ago he found something that would change his life and the lives of everyone he knew. Well, the truth is, it was one of the best chapters of my life, for my family, for my town. Y para muchísima gente. All right, I hope that helped everyone get a little transported into this story. That's why I love working with audio so much. So this is Teacapan we have right here on the map. Um, and that's where our story takes place 15 years ago. This is a fishing town of about 4,000 people located in Sinaloa, Mexico at the most Southern point of the state. It is such a small town. There's not a single traffic light. There's no grocery store. Um, there's one or two paved roads in the entire town. So this is a fishing town. Even on the, the entrance to the town, there's a big archway and it says Teacapan, town of fishermen. Um, every day at the beach, there are fishermen arriving from their, um, every morning at the beach, there are fishermen arriving with their catch from the night before. They're fishing mackerel, sea bass, stingray, shark, um, they even used to fish sea turtle back when it was still legal. Um, and everything here, the, the culture, the daily life, the traditions, it all circulates around fishing. Um, so this again is a catch that was brought in from the ocean. Um, fishermen spend the whole night working out on the open ocean, catching fish to bring into the market. Um, this man right here is holding mackerel or sierra, uh, and this is the preferred fish for making ceviche. Sinaloa is known for its ceviche, but this town, um, it is seafood and ceviche. I mean, it's at every party for breakfast, you eat fried fish. Um, it is, you know, seafood and fish is your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and it, the even the food itself, the way that they prepare the ceviche is unlike anything that I've seen in other parts of the state. Um, like again, just to show you that it's just such a big part of this town, you, you'll be walking down the street and you'll run into someone like this fisherman who's repairing his net. Um, it's, it's just everywhere that you look. Um, this is a stat, this is a uh, shrine for St. Andrew. He's the patron saint of fishermen. And the shrine is right, at, it's overlooking the dock where fishermen will leave at dusk to spend the night out on the ocean so they can stop here first um, and pray for protection. So our story begins um, here in this town and it's 15 years ago and they're going through a particularly bad spell. There's been rampant overfishing in the area and suddenly the populations of shrimp of fish are starting to drop off. You know, many of the fishermen are struggling to make a living, keep food on the table. There are families who are growing hungry, um, who are going hungry and no one really knows what's happened to the fish. They just know that they're gone. We'd send people out to fish and they wouldn't bring back anything. In fact, many would say, what's going on? And it's like, well, who knows? There aren't any fish, there's nothing. No hay, y no hay. It's getting so bad. The local businesses are closing. People are even trying to sell their fishing boats, but of course no one wants to buy them. And so one evening, Belen is sitting out in front of his house with this old friend. He's also a fisherman. And they're talking after a long day at work. And that's when Belen decides he's gonna share a bit of gossip that he heard that day. And it was from a guy who works on the shrimping boats. Now these are bigger boats and they have large nets, troweling nets that they drop into the ocean. They scrape along the ocean floor and they bring up shrimp. And earlier that day, this man had been working on the shrimping boat. They drop their nets in like they always do. They pull them back up. And when they pull up the net, they discovered something caught in the webbing that was beyond shocking. Si arrastraban los redes, one and then another calla de hacha fell out. 
El, el, el cayo es una, es una de las especies... El cayo es una de las especies que... Let's put it this way. It's one of the most expensive things you can catch. Pero de las más caras. All right. This is the cayo de hacha. Uh, cayo means scallop, and hacha translates to hatchet, and it gets, it gets that name for the shape of its shell, which looks like a hatchet. So over here you have one that is open, um, you have the entrails, and then right here you have this coin of white meat, and that is... That is the part that's consumed, that usually eaten raw, um, and it is considered a delicacy. Um, I also understand that it's native to the Sea of Cortez, and this is a product that it's a delicacy. It's sold to high-end restaurants all up along the coast in Mexico. It's also shipped out to Mexico City, where it's sold again in, in very upscale restaurants. And as Boleyn reiterates, this is one of the most expensive things you can possibly find in their oceans. So no one had ever caught this type of cayo in Teacapan before. And they're a little bit shocked by this story um, that, they're, that a cayo has appeared in, in a shrimping net. Then the following week when a shrimping boat catches another cayo, they bring it to Boleyn. And that's when he starts to get a big idea. Boleyn, who went to college for fisheries biology, he knows that this isn't just a coincidence. Typically, cayo are jammed between rocks. And so when you harvest them, you have to kind of cut them out, um, delodge them, if you will, from the, the crevasse where they've been, they've been living. So the mere fact that they've been swept up in this net tells Boleyn that there are so many of them piled on the ocean floor that they can be easily collected or, or uh, cut loose by the gentle tug of one of these nets. So he's starting to imagine that there is a pile of cayo lurking beneath the ocean water. And that's when um, he gets, starts to make a plan. So here is Teacapan from satellite imagery. Here, the snaking river is the estuary, and that's what lent this town to being a town of fishermen. That's what it is founded for, is for because it was such a great location for fishing, and it is in large part because of this estuary. So right here off of the, the mouth of the estuary, you have Playa La Tembora. So that is, um, it's right around here that this shrimping boat is going down and catching these cayo in its net. And so Belin decides that what they need to do is they have to get a scuba diver because this is deeper than any of them can go. Um, it's about 80 feet below the surface. No one has the equipment or the know-how to, to, to dive that far. So he goes to the local, a nearby city of Esquinapa, about 45 minutes away. They don't find anything. They drive two hours away to the larger city of Mazatlan and they still, they can't find the equipment. They can't find anyone who's able to do this. And then finally, Belin calls up a friend in Baja California where diving is more common. Fishermen make a living this way by going down into the ocean and, and harvesting thing, mollusks and, and things like cayo. And um, he gets a guy, a diver on the phone and um, he gets him to agree to, to come down. We asked him, how much will you charge us to do this job? And he said, how about we make a deal? If there's cayo, I won't charge you for the trip, but you'll give me a chance to fish some of it. If there's nothing, you'll pay for my trip there and back. Okay, está bien. So he came. But Belen also wanted to keep this a secret. Hay que ser, hay que ser discretos. Let's be discreet so that this doesn't turn into complete chaos. Everything must be done carefully. I said, you know what? If there are cayo, don't tell anyone. No diga nada. Okay, so I have a bit of an agreement going on. Um, the diver comes down, they take him out to an area more or less around here. They get his equipment on the boat, they go out. He puts on his white fisherman boots, Um, and he revs up his air compressor. So no one is diving here with an oxygen tank because that's far too expensive. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in just a minute. Um, using an air compressor is the preferred means of diving and it's also very dangerous. 
So the, the diver puts on a lead belt, which helps him sink to the bottom. He flops over the side of the boat and he sinks to the bottom of, of the ocean. And about an hour passes Lynn, his friend, his brother-in-law, they're all on the boat just waiting to see what he returns with. Andale, que cuando llegó. And when the diver came up, the surprise he had, 100 pounds of gallo. I said to him, what did it look like down there? You all are sitting on a mine of gold, he says. Wherever you step, there's gallo. Donde te pares, hay gallo. Oh, dear God. Ay, Dios de mi vida, dije yo. So the men had stumbled upon a massive colony of shellfish just off the town shore, and this is equivalent to finding something like sunken treasure. Researchers would later determine that it covered the stre a stretch of ocean floor about 35 miles long and a mile wide. It looks something like this. And the estimated value was somewhere around $2 million. So the next day, Belin gets in his truck and he drives two hours away to Mazatlan to go to this big government building where the federal fishing authorities are housed. It's called Conapesca. And he gets a meeting with one of the higher ups and he tries to explain his situation. To prove what he's found, he has a cooler full of his shellfish, of the cayo, because he needs, he needs them to believe him. And he explains what he wants. He wants there to be permits for all the fishermen in his town so that Kyle can be caught and sold legally. And he also knows that there needs to be some sort of regulation. They need to have a quota system because if there isn't some sort of intervention, this is going to be immediately overfished. He is aware of just how desperate the men in his town are because remember, they're coming off of the last few years of very, very bad fishing levels. So this is this is important that they be controlled somehow. And he's basically begging this agent to come in and help. And the agent says, yeah, you know, we'll see what we can do. Belin leaves feeling like, okay, I've done the right thing. I've gotten the ball rolling. Meanwhile, back in Tacopan, unfortunately, the scuba diver from Baja um, is out there catching Cayo because that was the agreement that they had. And the people in Diakopan can see him from the shore. It's so close. And they see this guy, a scuba diver, diving in, coming up a little bit while later, and they get curious. It's, um, there's always a, Belen says there's always a lot of gossip between the fishermen. So someone eventually gets in their boat and they, they scuttle over to see um, what is going on. And they see all of these big bags of Cayo de Acha sitting in the boat. And it's like a bomb goes off, right? This guy goes back to town. He tells everyone what he's just seen. Word is out and mayhem ensues. Um, to quote myself from my story, uh, almost immediately, everyone in the town, some of whom had never fished before in their lives, teachers, politicians, ranchers, bought boats and hired divers. And men who didn't know how to dive were signing up for the job. There was money to be made and everyone wanted in. Oh, sorry. Nope, I might be missing a piece of audio, that's okay. Yes, okay. So there's this piece of audio that I wanted to share and the Lynn is, I'll just read it for you. There was a doctor, a good friend of the fisherman. He bought three boats. He didn't even need the money. It made me so mad, so angry to see this type of person take advantage and they could give a damn, right? So this piece of audio really, I feel illustrates this question that we're starting to confront, which is who does this belong to? You know, in Belen's mind, in the fisherman's mind, you know, they've dedicated their whole lives to this trade. And now that there's this opportunity to make a lot of money, they fully believe that this is rightfully theirs. Of course, this is a natural resource. There is no intervention at a, from authorities at this point. No one is saying who, who can and cannot harvest Kayo. And so people are being opportunistic. Um, and as often the case, 
the rich are getting richer. Now, one positive aspect um, to the discovery of the Kayo, of everyone going out and fishing Kayo, is that very suddenly there's a ton of money in this town. It is exploding um, with earnings. People who were just making $10 before a day are now making $100 to even $150. You know, that is the, the price that this shellfish is earning them on the market. And a town where shops are closing, now they're living in this moment of glory and things are being revived, shops are being reopened. Everyone is looking for any excuse they can to party. Let's just say there was a lot of money. People bought cars and as much beer as they wanted. They had big weddings and parties. If they saw you walking by, they'd just offer you a plate of callo de hacha, which is something that we never ate. And now we could eat all we wanted. We felt proud. We felt really important because during this time, the economy of Tiacapan, I tell you, grew by 1,000%. Belin started fishing too. Now, something that I thought um, was really important while writing this story is that had it been told from the had it not been told from the perspective of the fishermen, like in any sort of traditional article, they might have described the fishermen as the villains and the cayo as the prey. And what I wanted to do was show that these are families, these are human beings and their parents, and that and for that matter, they are like most of us interested in improving, improving their lot in life. Um, yes, there were parties and there were bad actors who were exploiting the situation, but because of this money, people are able to do things they could have never imagined, like put their children through college or buy a car that they could later use to start a business or install running water in their homes. And so I often think when we observe these situations, um, things like poaching or the you know, exploitation of natural resources, and we're standing at this position of immense economic privilege. And I say that as, as someone who lives in the United States, and we have a tendency to sympathize with the animals that are being, that are being uh, extracted or hunted. And I wanted to show that I believe these communities of people also deserve our empathy. Um, these are people, many of whom are living hand to mouth, truly on, in many cases, the, the brink of survival. And so, um, Yes, we may see them as greedy, um, but it is not entirely that black and white. There is nuance here. Oh, so a few weeks go by since the Kyle have been discovered and the news has spread. People are coming from across the state to fish Kyle, and then the news catches on and reporters have come to town. And they love this story of like the Cinderella town that was you know, down on their luck and now suddenly is exploding with opportunity and money. Uh, the headlines are things like the cocaine of the sea is what they're calling it. Another one is, of course, white gold fever, which became the title for this piece. Um, and I found this clip from Univision and they did like a long segment on it. Um, this was not just local news. This was national when it first broke. This was a big deal. And people were really excited and interested in seeing what was happening. Um, so I just wanted to show this to you because we can actually see the folks diving. Right. Now this is entirely in Spanish, so I'm just gonna narrate a little bit. I just wanted to show people a little bit of what we're seeing just in terms of like the talent itself, these are guys getting ready to go fishing for the day to go catch some kayo. Um, this, of course, is the fisherman that the reporter is shadowing. And he's explaining, you know, they're all going to drive up about or boat up about 25 minutes to where, where this giant bank of kayo has been discovered. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Okay, here we're going to see the diving. Okay. So as I mentioned, we do not use, this is not an oxygen tank. That tube right there is what's connected to the air compressor that is forcing oxygen through that tube 
that then goes into the diver's mask. That is an air compressor that's run off of gasoline, right? This is pretty rudimentary. Um, here we have our diver and he's talking about some of the dangers that are inherent with using this machine. The tube can get tied up. Sometimes it can break. Um, if the machine breaks while the diver's underwater, they have to be careful. They can't come up too quickly. Look at the fence. Very dangerous. He, that's his lead belt. And you see that he's wearing jeans and fishing boots. And I think this part is so cool because the cameraman actually went down with him or they brought a camera down there so we could see. Now you'll see he's holding a rope in his hand. And that is El Cabo de Vida. So the fishermen who are waiting on top in that boat, you see it? Um, they're waiting to see if they feel a tug. If you feel two tugs, that means that the diver is ready to come back up and they'll pull that rope and they'll deliver him back up. If it's one tug, there's something that's gone wrong. Something has happened on the ocean floor and he needs help now. Um, and that is the extent of their communication. So as you can imagine, incredibly risky, very dangerous. And this is how all of this cayo is being extracted. Not just in at this moment in Teacapan, but this is pretty widespread across, across all of Mexico. So it's been, oh, okay. It's been about four months since the Cayo were found. And now the amount of boats that are out on the water has more than tripled. There are about 300 boats out there on a daily basis and they're all harvesting around 100 to 200 pounds a day of pure Cayo meat. So not even counting the shells. And this entire time, Boleyn has been fishing under a self-imposed quota. He thinks that he needs to send an example for the other fishermen because this is the responsible thing to do. He owns four fishing boats and he has fishermen who go out and fish for him and he's only gonna send in two. And um, this is his way of sort of demonstrating that we can control ourselves. We don't have to fish this into extinction. So at around that time, a local university comes and they perform an, a study of the coyote population. They hold a meeting for all of the fishermen out on the boardwalk. And they tell them that this bank of coyote is so large, it can last 10 years. Other sources claim it could have lasted as long as 30 years, but they have to fish it sustainably. That means limiting how much is harvested so that the population it can reproduce. And this is Belin, he, feel like he, he's, he feels like he's found his moment and he stands up and he talks to everyone. Gentlemen, we have to take care of the shellfish. We have to ration how much we catch. What do we gain by fishing 200 pounds each? If they are not going to give us a good price, let's only fish 100 pounds per boat so they pay us a higher price, and the gallo will last longer. So Belen understands they cannot keep extracting cayo at the current rate. And in no time at all, they're gonna be back to where they were before with nothing left to fish. He also knows that they're flooding the market with cayo, and that's driving the price down. It's now at about half of what it was when they originally started out. And he wants everyone to abide by this quota. And he knows it can work because in other communities in Mexico, fishermen preserve their popu the fish populations by fishing under these self-imposed quotas. He knows it can work. But the fishermen, they don't seem to believe him. Perhaps they don't believe that the kaya will ever run out. Maybe they think, um, maybe they're so happy that they don't want to admit that this euphoric chapter will, of fishing will eventually end. And I think in many ways, it also speaks to something that Belin shared, which is the mentality of the fishermen. And that is that you have to fish today because you don't know if you're gonna be able to fish tomorrow. So this sort of survival mentality, short-term thinking is really what he's up against in trying to convince them to change, change their, their approach. So after about six months, the authorities have finally managed to issue licenses for the fishermen. And they've told them that they're on their own to regulate themselves. It turns out that Conopesca, the agency that the Lynn went to at the beginning is such a rigid, large government agency 
that in order to do things like issue to, to enforce quotas, they have to perform multiple studies. Um, they, it, it's, it's like there are so many levels of bureaucratic red tape. The system just isn't designed to protect the sort of one-off discovery. It's designed to protect populations that we already know exist, right? There's the fishing licenses. There are patrols by um, uh, people who are essentially uh, wildlife uh, I don't want to say police officers, but um, you know, there are people, agents who are there to make sure that everyone is following the rules. There, there, there is that system in place, but it's not able to be nimble enough to come in last minute and try and protect something before, just as it's been discovered, before it's completely wiped out. So as more Kayo is fished out of this bank that we saw off the coast of Tiakapan. The divers are having to actually go deeper and deeper to continue to extract kayo. And as they go deeper and deeper, they're also spending far longer on the ocean floor and they're getting the bends. There are also issues, like I mentioned, with the equipment. Um, there are pipes or there are tubes that explode. Um, and what the result is that seven divers die because there is not a hyperbaric chamber in Teakapan, right? They just have a tiny little clinic. And the, cl the closest hyperbaric chamber, which is used to treat the bends, is two hours away. And in one instance, Bolin, one of his divers gets sick and he calls an ambulance and they agree to meet him halfway. So they, he gets the diver in his truck, they race as fast as they can to the halfway point of Esquinapa, and when they get when he gets there, the ambulance is waiting and they hoist him into the ambulance and he takes off and he gets to Mazatlan in time where he's able to get a hyperbaric into a hyperbaric chamber and he his life is saved. But there's just so many people who were not as fortunate. And you know, I think I can imagine that there are probably some folks in the group, perhaps professionally trained divers, thinking, um, wow, how stupid were people, you know, what were they thinking doing this sort of work? And for me, it really highlights the level of desperation, just how far people were willing to go in order to have a shot at a decent living, right? They're, they're putting everything on the line. They may not know how to dive properly. They may not have a clue that there's a, a specific limit to how long they should be down on the, on the ocean floor. All they know is that this is their chance to to earn money for themselves and perhaps their, their families as well. So at this point, nothing can stop the onslaught. People are dying. Belen has tried to entice the fishermen to fish less by giving them better prices for their catch. Nothing works. No one is willing to relent. And this is when it becomes a race to the bottom because when you hold back on your catch, but you know your neighbor is just going to go out and fish that portion anyway, why would you comply? And eventually even Berlin gives up. He sends out all his boats and decides that he'll reap as much benefit as he's able to, because down the line, he knows that just like everyone else, he's going to be completely screwed. You know, he might as well enjoy this moment while he can earn what he can before it's gone because they're all gonna have to kind of suffer through um, the after, the, the, the reality afterwards of being left without anything to fish. And so we're now finally arriving at the end of the story of Kyle Beacha. Nearly a year and a half, nearly, sorry, less than a year since they were discovered. Now there are so many shells and Kayo guts that the fishermen have been carelessly tossing over their boats as they harvest and clean the kayo, that that's polluted the water. And it's ruined this ecosystem that allowed the kayo to thrive down there for decades. This causes a mass die off and the last kayo to be extracted or fished out are already dead. So we're at the end of our story. Today, Teakapan is nearly, the fishing in Teakapan is nearly at an end. Overfishing and climate change has really brought the industry to its knees. 
And the young people don't follow their parents into this work anymore because they know it's grueling and it can't really provide a living. Most people, including Belin's kids, have left the town for work in the city or even in the United States. So if my small presentation has piqued your interest, I just wanna point you all towards the full story, which you can hear on Snap Judgment. The episode's called Mother Nature. And I wanna give a brief shout out to the Food and Environment Reporting Network, where I'm a contributing writer and they fund reporting that focuses on agriculture and environment. And without their support, this story would not have been possible. And now I just want to pivot a little bit and talk a bit about what I do as an agricultural uh, journalist. So I have spent the last few years telling everyone that I am not a science journalist. And yet I keep getting invited to speak at science events. And I think this comes from a place of my own insecurity, um, mainly because my stories, if you listen to them or read them, are not often chocked full of data, analytics, and, and graphs. I am horrible at math. And um, I might not even directly quote a, a scientist in the work that I do, because I think it's so important to keep the workers or the producers at the, the center of my stories. Um, but I'm starting to notice a sort of shift. You know, I've been cultivating this beat for the last several years. And I often say that I report on the intersection of agriculture and immigration. And we're talking about farm workers, like you see in this photo. We're talking about meat packing workers and fishermen like Boleyn. But now I'm starting to think that I need to change that to say the intersection of agriculture and climate change. Now more than ever, the impacts of climate change are increasingly relevant to my reporting because these are the people who are living on the front lines of this crisis. As the temperatures rise, not only will, this food, will our food be impacted, but more importantly, it will impact the people who produce it. So in this photo here, we have migrant workers who are harvesting lettuce in Yuma, Arizona. They cross the border every day from Mexico to do this work. And in the fall in Yuma, average temperatures are around 102 degrees, which is the start of lettuce season. And on average, a US farm worker endures 21 unsafe days during the growing season. And by mid-century, that's set to increase to 39 days. And we are already seeing harrowing news of farm workers dying from heat stroke in places you might not expect like Washington and Oregon. So this is very rapidly becoming one of the top concerns. And we see this too in places like Teocapan, right? How climate change is impacting them. Warming waters mean that the schools of fish that these fishermen rely on are seeking cooler waters out in the open ocean. So you'll remember I showed you those photos of folks coming back in the morning from having spent the, the, the night out fishing. So this means that the fishermen must not now travel further in order to catch their fish and that costs them more in gasoline to get there. It also means that their work is becoming increasingly dangerous. They're out there at night because fish schools of fish tend to be more active under moonlight. And um, yeah, this is all just combined to make their job more expensive, more dangerous, more grueling. And even if we zoom back to an even larger and more, take a more macro perspective on this intersection of climate change and agriculture. Um, I just wanna point out that the many people who have gathered in migrant camps along the US-Mexico border, folks who are hoping to seek asylum in the United States, many of these people are former farmers. They were driven from their land due to climate change, due to under, un, under production of their crops, due to unreliable rains and weather patterns and they moved to cities and in the cities that were vulnerable to things like extortion and gang violence and so from there sought refuge north so this is it's all very very interconnected i think a lot of times when i tell people that i report on agriculture i get a lot of blank stares and um, i admit that to me, even to me it sounds a bit boring but when we start to see our world through this perspective of food systems and who produces our food, I think it's really fascinating. Um, and it can tell you so much about our politics, our own sense of empathy, 
and even our, our understanding of science. And um, in our current generation, I think this is going to become one of the most important topics of our, of our time, our farm workers and climate change, food system and climate change. Um, I, I'm gonna just leave my presentation real quick because I wanna make sure we have time for a video. Um, I, Belin was not able to join us uh, here. He does not have a very reliable internet connection. Um, this is also the day that his sons are coming back from the US after a very long stint um, working on a farm in Washington. They've been there for nine months but I did wanna be able to include him in this presentation somehow. Um, so uh, the folks at the Frankie program were very generous and helped me to put subtitles to a quick interview that I did with him via video. And I've asked him, what does he hope comes from this story being published and out there? And what does he believe that the fishermen have learned from the Cayo de Acha? Buenas tardes. Mira, este... Con respecto a esta pregunta, ¿qué es lo que esperamos eh, que aprendan las demás gentes que vieron o, o al, tal vez hayan admirado el, este video de podcast? Pues esto es, es algo que eh, en interés personal es para que la gente que lo logre ver sepa las situaciones de las comunidades pesqueras y sobre todo que se sepa la pesca racional de las especies y los recursos. Y sobre todo ojalá y... y y esto sirva de algo para otros sitios o campos pesqueros que tienen este recurso, pero pues no saben cuidarlo, como aquí lo que nos pasó a nosotros hace varios años. Pero pues en eso estamos, ¿no? de que ojalá y la gente haga conciencia de que los recursos, si no se cuidan, se acaban. Y no hay otra más que tener una pesca sustentable para poder gozar de este recurso Tan, tan, este, tan bueno en el mercado y donde quiera que sea. Se han aprendido muchas cosas sobre el tiempo de, del callo de hacha, de ese tremendo año que tuvimos eh, de, de grandes, de, de muchos volúmenes grandísimos de especies en estos lugares que se dio. Pero pues a nos, nosotros nos quedó un recuerdo enorme a la generación que nos tocó capturar, eh, este, comercializar esos productos. Y nos, y nos quedó la idea de que tenemos que esforzarnos más. ¿no? Las nuevas generaciones que están ahorita eh, desconocen un poco, un poco el, el tema este. Lo que sí me agradaría y me gustaría mucho, que ojalá, ojalá y pudieran eh, este, hacer este... este este video que, se, que hizo nuestra amiga Esther, lo hicieron al cambio en español para meterlo a nivel nacional y que se dieran cuenta de las nuevas generaciones qué es lo que pasa si no se piensa a tiempo. Entonces, eh, hoy, hoy creo que este es un tema muy importante, ¿no? Entonces, las nuevas generaciones poco saben de esto, hay que saberlos, hay, hay que eh, pues enseñarlos y decirles qué es lo bueno y qué es lo malo para alguna de las especies sedentarias que se van a acabar si no hay un buen manejo. Pero esto no nos quedó muy claro. De... But I just want to finish up with um, pointing out some of the, a little bit of the different style that I work in, which is narrative storytelling and how that can overlap with science to make it more powerful. So you listening to my story, if you have the opportunity, you might notice there's not a whole lot of science there um, in terms of numbers and terminology. And um, I, I worked with a really brilliant editor. Her name is Nancy Lopez. And she really worked with me to kind of trim all of that out because she, like I, really believe in the power of a good story. Um, you know, unlike a traditional news article, these stories have beginning, middles, and ends. They have a narrative arc. They have a character who we follow on their journey. Um, and maybe they can overcome the challenges they face. Maybe they can slay the dragon, or maybe they can't. Maybe they can't stop all of the fishermen from extracting this natural resource before it's completely wiped out. 
But um, the idea is that we follow them on their journey and we learn to empathize with them. And I think it's such an important tool, especially when we're talking about climate change. We've been so good at ignoring this crisis for so many generations, even with the science really being right in front of our faces. And I think it's because it's a huge concept. I think it's overwhelming. And I think especially right now, we find ourselves in these news cycles that can be incredibly exhausting, right? Like we open up the news in the morning and there's so many stories that immediately deserve our attention. And, and I'm talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about democracy in this country, um, a war raging in Europe. There's so much to pay attention to right now in this age of information. And so we really have to work at how we can go about getting this information, this, this notion, they're getting people to, to care, to engage um, when we are all so overwhelmed, right, by the amount of information. So I really look at a good story as sort of this, this Trojan horse, if you will, that we can tell a story that is entertaining, that is engaging, that helps someone empathize with a person on the other side of the world in a completely different uh, socioeconomic status and be able to, to empathize with them, to see what it's like to walk in their shoes um, and to see what it, the impacts of things like climate change or in this case, overfishing really does to an individual or to a community. Um, and so, you know, when we, I think we've, we've learned to think about these things separately for a very long time, right? Like, as I mentioned, I'm hesitant to say that I'm a science journalist or that my work is scientific um, in nature. But when we start to think about how science and good storytelling can be paired together, I think we have the opportunity to do something incredibly powerful and immensely beautiful. Um, how can we tell these important stories in a way that catches the attention of audiences that might not be able to, might not want to listen otherwise? Um, I was just recently reminded of this this morning. There was actually some research from Yale that was published talking about how folks who are um, Republican have, folks who identify as, as, as Republican have a higher rate of death from the COVID-19 disease. And so you have to think, you know, the science is right there, right? We all have seen the science around COVID-19. And unless there is, sometimes there's, there's, there has to be a good story to accompany that, right? And some people, there might be a bad story that is telling people um, the wrong thing. So, you know, like it's, it's how do we embrace this information? How do we tell it through a story that can do good in this world, who can get people again to listen, to get on board, to engage, um, as opposed to gloss over and as opposed to uh, take a story in a direction that um, it shouldn't. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Esther, for such a fantastic um, talk and um, explaining to us the multifaceted and complex human interactions and the sort of this interleaving of uh, nature and the human nature and the decisions that we make and the complexity of that process. And, uh, you know, um, science doesn't have to be just about data. Science, um, science really does, is done in the larger human context. And so um, I, um, I don't know, I consider your story to be deeply intertwined with uh, scientific concerns and scientific questions. So let me throw open the floor for uh, questions. I don't see anything in the Q&A yet. So please feel free to add your questions in there. Um, Thank you so much for this entirely engrossing and uh, very tragic story um, and for telling it and bringing this all to our attention and a wider audience. Um, Ever the Optimist, what are the prospects for the Cayo coming back in this area? And uh, what are Belen's thoughts about what he, if he's around, what he might do next time or not do in that situation? 
Yeah, Balin is a, a big dreamer. And he is, I think, um, after I talked to his family about just asking some questions about his character, it turns out that he is ever the champion of sustainable fishing. And it comes to anything from shrimp to sea bass, he is there trying to mitigate issues and ensure that everyone is respecting this wildlife. That's, I think, something very near and dear to his heart. And so, I mean, it's been 15 years, right, since that coyote bank was nearly wiped out. Um, and it had probably sat undisturbed for decades. I don't know how long the estimates, I'm not sure what they look like, but who knows how long it will take to grow back. The fact is, is that it likely will, or that it already has started to grow back. Um, and it's sort of like poking the bear, right? Like when do we make the decision to get a diver out here, to bring them back down, to see what it looks like down there now? Um, Boleyn is very eager to do this. He, I think because I took an interest in this story, really wants to, sh to explore it with me. He wants to get a diver to come down. He wants to see what's down there now. Um, even though there have not been any changes necessarily to change what the outcome would look like. Um, he believes that fishermen in the town have learned. They learned their lesson. They would never do that again. And perhaps um, talking to him, I really got the sense that a lot of people feel a lot of shame for what happened, you know, that they um, didn't act in time. They didn't act appropriately. And um, I think more than anything, the death of those seven divers really weighs on them. And so there is an eagerness to start it all again, um, but there is also this belief that perhaps they would be able to regulate it themselves. And Boleyn is also very much interested in the idea of making it into some sort of a farming system so that these could be generated in the way that I guess oysters are um, to have always accessible tile um, in, cages in the ocean, something like that, that would make this more long lasting. Thank you. We join him in his dream. You can convey that to him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more regards from Yale. Uh, so from the audience, thank you so much for this amazing talk. I have a couple questions. First, how did you come across this story? And second, what advice do you have for aspiring journalists who want to do this kind of work? So I think I can answer that in, in one, one swoop. So I, um, I have a relationship with this town that dates back to when I was in high school. I was at a public high school, one that um, really valued travel. So instead of sports teams, we did things do like uh, language immersion trips. And we had an exchange set up with the school at Yakupan. So I went down there when I was first 16. I stayed with a host family. I returned again um, my senior year of high school. And then just thanks to social media, you know, my host siblings were my age and we continued to stay in touch. I spent plenty of time in Mexico studying Spanish. So they were, you know, we were always able to communicate pretty fluently. Um, and so that's how I stumbled upon that story. Um, Kaya was actually, uh, that story I actually heard for the first time when I was in high school. And um, it was something that just seemed so mystic and so unbelievable that one day, once I just, you know, last year, it occurred to me that I could make a story out of that, um, that I had the resources, that I now had the skills. And of course, I had those connections. And I think for folks that um, aspire to do this sort of work, I mean, obviously, building that skill set is important. But the most important thing is that innate sense of curiosity and looking for those stories in your own life, right? Like what, what paths have you crossed in your life with what sorts of people, um, what unbelievable stories do you have in your back pocket that you might tell friends and family when you're all sitting down at dinner or um, when you really want to, you know, impress someone with a good story, you know, what do you go back to? So like what, what stories are already a part of your life? Um, that could be made into something like a story, an audio documentary. And I think that a lot of us have more of those stories than we, than we realize. So it's, uh, Esther, if I may um, use my prerogative to ask you this question. So Sinaloa is a complicated place, right? Because isn't that the name of one of the big drug cartels um, in Mexico? Yeah. So I'm curious about how the larger culture of that place kind of steeped with that. How do you think that impacted 
um, the thinking, the um, you know, uh, the way in which um, they viewed commercialization, um, and yeah, yeah, um, I can speak to some of that. You know, this was 15 years ago when the Kaya were extracted, so. Um, the situation was different. Um, absolutely now, Sinaloa is certainly um, a state that's considered very infiltrated and controlled by the cartel. Um, and I would say that absolutely extends to Tiacapan to an extent. So you have things, um, the sale of beer is controlled by the cartel in that town at eight o'clock. The stores that sell beer must close their doors. And then the only stores that are open that sell beer are owned by the cartel. So it's pervasive. Um, the folks part of this folks who are part of this organized um, criminal organization are looking for any way to generate money. Um, Incomes, right? I mean, yeah, uh, multiple strands of money, and exactly. uh, yes, that you know, sort of ethics are not really part of that discussion there. And uh, right. So it's it's what's difficult, I think, is that you're looking at a town which subsisted for so long off of fishing. And now that source of revenue for these families is drying up and it's becoming harder. So your kids either leave to go somewhere else or you're unfortunately um, there, you know, you face the possibility of working to some extent with these organized gangs. So I've heard things like people using their boats to transport drugs, you know, really dangerous, very dangerous stuff. Um, even things like a uh, cartel may be fronting the money for gasoline and taking a cut of the, the profits that you earn from fishing. And so this highlights something that's really important, which is that not only is this area already very unstable politically in terms of who controls this state, um, it's very apparent that it is the cartels and not necessarily the, the government of Mexico. Um, but as things become more unstable because of climate change, people don't have a lot of other options yeah. for making a living. Um, right. And I think people start to see an increase in, in instability. Yeah, and I think um, you made the point wonderfully that you know finding sustainable options um, is really, really challenging, right? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Berlin is a huge champion of there being more shrimp farms, there being uh, packaging houses, things that allow them to export, to, to sell to markets directly. Um, all of this stuff is infrastructure that if the fishermen had, would allow them to possibly sustain their way of life to some degree. Uh, there just isn't the upfront investment. Right, and also, you know, be sort of more economically self-sufficient in a way and be more in control of their destiny, right? I mean, I think that's the dream. That's what he's dreaming. Right, that's what they had, you know, they had that and then it was taken away. A lot of that overfishing comes from commercial fishing fleets from foreign countries. And of course, we know that um, low-income countries uh, have not contributed to climate change to the extent that, say, America has. So there was just... Yeah, I was just going to bring that point up that I think your story is very emblematic of the point that, you know, the regions that are going to actually feel the impact of climate change, either directly because of floods and other natural disasters, or a shrinking of their old ways of livelihood, are sadly not the places that have contributed uh, in a major way to the, um, you know, the carbon and to um to, to climate change and the deleterious effects of climate change. Yeah, so I really found that your story was really beautiful at sort of multiple levels. So thank you once again for this, this gorgeous um, study and book. Uh, so we have a question from um, Sylvia back in the audience. Um, Oh, sorry, I missed one question prior to that. Um, the question is from uh, one of uh, someone in the audience who asks, I know you worked in radio journalism for a while earlier in your career. How did you pivot to becoming a freelancer and writing about agriculture? Um, I actually began writing about agriculture. I was, it was my beat um, as my last job at a public radio station um, for NPR. I was part of a regional collaborative that contributed stories across the country to NPR about agriculture. And um, I just found that I really loved it. And I really wanted to focus on labor and agriculture specifically. That had been a passion of mine for a long time. And um, what I found was that I just got a little tired of the uh, NPR format. As much as I loved working for them, I really wanted to be able to do more long form in-depth stuff 
things that really allow characters to evolve and um, allow for a bit more flexibility and creativity. And so I made the decision to go freelance um, in 2019, just a few months before the pandemic, I quit my job and I moved to Mexico. And uh, it had been a long held dream of mine, right? To do international work, especially. And so uh, when it seemed that the world was literally just caving in on me because I had made this risk during such um, really just bad timing, it wound up actually being uh, fairly advantageous because um, suddenly the topic that I had now spent three years cultivating this beat uh, was suddenly on headlines nationally, right? Um, it became an immensely important issue because we were, for the first time, a lot of Americans were being forced to contemplate where their food comes from. And if those people are sick, they can't process it, they can't harvest it. And so um, in a way it was, and I hate to say this, but it was, it was fortunate um, that the timing was such. And so I think those sorts of elements have allowed me to, to pick up a fairly successful freelance career from the beginning. Thanks, Esther. So an insightful comment from Sylvia, um, and we can build on it and turn into a question. She says she wanted to tell you that she thinks you presented the story beautifully, I have to agree. And she noticed that you avoided making villains, which in a Cinderella windfall story might be tempting. The benefit of your narrative left us eager to learn more and to feel included. So maybe you could speak a bit to that. Um, how did you avoid that, that glaring temptation to identify villains and protagonists? Um, you know, I think that honestly, it was just trying to follow the good story, right? The good story is the hero and he's at the center of it and we're watching him step by step. I think if there's a villain in this story, it's perhaps the regulatory bodies of Mexico. Um, and as soon as that leaves my mouth, I'm like immediately kind of, it gets really boring, right? Um, and we all know, you know, we all know what that's like for the most part, that the, the regulations aren't working. Um, I feel like we can assume that is true, not just perhaps in Mexico, but other countries around the world. And so there, I didn't really want to spend too much time diving into that um, just because I felt like it took away from the story. Uh, and I didn't want to, you know, um, also make this about the other fishermen who are coming in, um, there was a big issue towards the end, what Boleyn called pirate fishermen that were coming in at night and they were fishing the Cayo before any of the other fishermen could get out there. Uh, these were guys from, you know, far away. And um, I also didn't feel like it was fair to villainize them. You know, like just the, the, the fishermen of Tacopan were very, um, they were very adamant that they weren't going to stop people from coming into their town and fishing Kyle because everyone is just trying to get by, you know, they're all in this struggle together in a lot of ways. And so, um, if they weren't, you know, Berlin can be angry at the doctors and the ranchers and the politicians who got boats and went in and fished Kyle. But, um, I also feel that as a reporter from the United States, I honestly don't know if their economic standing is, even much better perhaps than my own if they're middle class in Mexico that you know you know what I'm saying like I'm I don't think it's fair as someone from my someone from my position to necessarily villainize anyone in this in this situation because I've been born with so much opportunity and and relative wealth so I think it was just checking my privilege honestly no, but Esther, it's also uh, wonderful to hear um, the humility, the place of humility and learning that you have come from. I think that makes um, the story, I mean, it shines through in the story. So you. as you can see, we are all gushy fans. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, are there any uh, further questions for Esther um, before we close? Ty, did you want to have the final uh, question? Where's your next story? <laughs> Not in Mexico. What are you working on? My my next um, dream story is about these canals in Mexico City. That um, it's an area now called Xochimilco, and these canals were what originally the Mexica or the indigenous community that um, Cortez discovered when he discovered Mexico 
were living then in Mexico City. This is the area where they lived and they had built these canals and their whole city was a floating city. Um, of course, that's all been destroyed. And so what's left is a small region of the city called Xochimilco where some of these canals still exist. Um, and there is this wild story <laughs> from the 70s when politicians in Mexico wanted to make Xochimilco more attractive as a tourist destination. And someone had the idea to introduce manatees into the canals. And um, what resulted was that the manatees did not survive. It was not the right environment for them. It was far too cold. Um, but then rumors started to spread that locals were catching them and eating them and making um, manatee tacos. And so I know this sounds all really wild and preposterous, but um, it was a story that was so unfathomable that when I heard it, I thought it was just folklore. And actually by doing research, discovered that it did in fact happen, though it is very, um, it's a very sort of like succinct chapter in Mexico's history and there isn't a whole lot written about it. Um, but it's an, an example and a really enthralling story, I think, about what happens when humans try to mess with a natural environment too much, right? Like you have a perfect ecosystem, which is this, these, this swamp, this canal area, and you can't just introduce whatever animal that you want into it to make it into some sort of a lucrative opportunity. So it's, um, we'll see, we're still, I'm still working on it. There's also plenty of other stories in the works, but um, I feel like that was more up the, sort of in, in line with the, the Cayo de Acha piece. So we'll, we'll see how it turns out and when I can get back to Mexico City to do those interviews. I think we'd all agree there couldn't be anybody better to tell that story. <laughs> we look forward to it and bring it to us. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all so much for, for having me as a part of this. Um, it really was such a great opportunity. Yeah, um, thank you. It was uh, a real privilege for us to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much, Esther. And here's wishing you the best in your next adventure. And we eagerly look forward to hearing more about it. Well, so on behalf of uh, the Frankie program and the audience, thanks so much for coming today. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye.